Yeah, hi. Um, first, I want to offer my sincerest thanks to our fans, to our players, to their families, our families, to our partners, to our staff, and to Ted. Um, what we're undertaking is hard, and uh, everybody showed up. They showed up every day um, to help us along the way. They deserve our greepest, deepest gratitude for their resilience, for their care, uh, for their support and their trust this season and for future seasons. And I just want to say thank you to them. Thank you to you guys, too. Um, you spend so much of your time and your journalistic passion following us, telling our story as you see it, maybe not with the optimism that I would tell it. But nevertheless, I appreciate your truth, your truth searching, your truth telling, um, your professionalism, your commitment to your craft. We are a hard cover right now, um, and yet you guys also show up every day. You reach out, you, you try to find uh, the truth, you try to find the story. Um, and the one thing that I do really want you guys to know is that the two of us are here to help you, not, not run from you. And so to the extent that we can do anything for you guys, just reach out. That's, that's partly why we're here too. When we came together in May of 2023 uh, with the objective to reinvent the organization and set a course to fulfill our highest aspirations, it started with uh, a first day and then a second day and a third day, and we're nearing our first anniversary together. Um, we developed a plan, we communicated that plan, and we started the journey. And we are now sort of at the conclusion of season one of that journey. Um, and we have some difficulties that, that we'll, we'll talk about, but uh, a tremendous amount of hope came from this season, and, and we'll talk about that too. We began the rebuild knowing that, I used it. <laughs> We began the rebuild acknowledging that it was going to be hard. Uh, it was going to be long. We were gonna to have to make some tough decisions and endure some, some tough days, some tough games along the way. Clearly we did that. Um, but eventually we wanted it to start to feel like a new place for the folks that had been here um, with higher standards, loftier expectations, and a heightened level of accountability and togetherness. And I think that a lot of you heard from our players the other day. Um, I hope you heard some of their, their positive reflections in, in those areas. We acknowledged that the gains that we would make organizationally were very unlikely to show up in the box scores, very unlikely to show up in the standings. They would show up in how our players and our staff felt every day when they came to work. They would show up in uh, their individual improvements, whether it was skill, leadership, performance, uh, their physical um, health, their mental health, whatever the case may be, um, that it would uh, it would show up in how their bodies respond to heavier minutes, how their bodies respond to injury. And importantly for us, whether the people that came into our building every day were enjoying being here. And again, you heard from a lot of our guys and um, we heard from a lot of our guys over the last handful of days and they registered that. And for, so from that limited perspective, we're, we're, we're proud of that. In our exit interviews, like I said, we received a lot of encouraging feedback. Um, it's refreshing to hear in the early stages of a rebuild, uh, particularly under the weight of that we feel uh, of win-loss scrutiny. When we came into the season, there were a handful of things that we wanted to see. Um, one we are very, very pleased with, and that is individual player improvement, um, particularly uh, improvement befitting what, what turned out to be a completely reconstructed player development program. And so our players and our staff leaned really heavily into that program and their individual result, their individual results, I think are a testament to their work and the quality of the program that we tried to put in place. And so we're really, really pleased with our players' individual improvements. Um, the one that was most disappointing, frankly, no secret, was our competitiveness. Um, it's one of our five organizational pillars. And I think that there were just far too many games that, um, we didn't bring the level of competitiveness that we are capable of bringing and that a team that is walking into a game um, trying to punch above its weight, that was really the one thing that we couldn't forfeit. And there were just too many games, too many moments, too many halves along the way where we forfeited competitiveness. And if you do that in this league, particularly when you're um, sort of in the cycle where we are, you're going to have a really hard time recovering. And so um, there were games that we just, we didn't show up to compete 
or we showed up to compete for 12 minutes or 24 minutes or whatever the case may be, and that's not what we talked about. It's not what we preach on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and it costs us a lot of games. And so on a going forward basis, that's just going to be one of the things that's going to make us better going into next season is uh, a renewed focus on competitiveness, teaching it, coaching it, practicing it, um, some, some encouraging signs on that front, uh, particularly as it relates to the second half of the season. Um, it, is, it is undeniable that we won only 18% of our basketball games. But in the second half of the season, we won 40% of our quarters and we won 40% of our halves. That's clearly not a whole game, but we're looking for signs. And those are really encouraging signs. Uh, a couple of others. Um, it was 60% of our games. We were within six points, two possessions in the final three minutes. And then in a third of our games, we were within three points or a single possession in the final 30 seconds. We had a really hard time closing games. But we were in a lot of these basketball games, particularly in the second half of the year. And that's momentum that we get to carry into the off season and in the next season. Uh, two more areas that were really important to us, um, enhancing our professionalism, our accountability and our habits. We feel like we are more mature, we are more focused, we are a more professional outfit than we were a year ago. That's, that's on the court and off the court. Um, our staff and our players have taken a responsibility uh, for their professionalism and they take it seriously. We have developed an accountability to each other, to the work, to the increments, and uh, that will bleed into the off season. We'll continue fortifying those habits and eventually those habits are gonna make the work that we do stickier and easier. So generally speaking, we're satisfied with the professionalism, accountability, and the habits that uh, we demonstrated this season. And then the last one on that front is enhanced organizational appeal. One of our objectives, effective really immediately when we came aboard, was to level up the operation and demonstrate to the player talent and staff talent both in our walls and outside of our walls that we're gonna become an appealing place to play and work. I've heard from our players, you guys have heard from our players, I've heard from our staff, um, that they believe in what we're doing and they can, artic they can articulate some of the gains that we've made and they share that information with their friends and their colleagues around the league. We've heard from staff and, and agents and players elsewhere as well. And they say, hey, look, you know, we're hearing good things. Um, it's clearly not showing up in the, uh, in the standings yet, but we're hearing good things. And they pay attention to that kind of thing. Um, it's really important for us because at the, at the very end of the day, uh, we want to win at the highest levels and that requires high level talent. And you want high level talent to want to play for you. You want high level staff talent to want to work for you. And so it's our job to create an environment where uh, they can thrive when they're here, but in order to get here, they first have to want to be here. And so we're, we're very pleased with uh, a lot of the feedback that we've gotten on that front. Checking your battery life here, Josh, we're good. Um, <clears throat> we do not believe that wins are producible on their own. We believe that uh, there's no secret lever, no magic pill, that just one moment helps you achieve the goals that you've set out to achieve. We've talked about it ad nauseum. Our players are tired of hearing it. They're, gonna, they're not gonna stop hearing it. But for us, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's a lot like tilling a field. It's, uh, you have to turn over the soil multiple times. You have to aerate, you have to fertilize and fertilize and fertilize, and you have to plant seeds. And then after you wait, you have to pour in uh, everything required to, to get those seeds to germinate so that you can eventually harvest them, but it takes a long time. And so for us, for us, harvests and wins, we think of them as a result. We think of them as a byproduct of an extraordinary quality and volume of investment, of deposits, of work, of belief, um, requiring the right people at the right time all coming together. And um, we have to continue our focus on those deposits. We have to continue the focus on, on tilling the field. Uh, meanwhile, there is no tolerance organizationally for mediocrity. There is no tolerance for shortcuts and uh, absolutely no forgiveness for poor effort. And so to the extent that uh, you saw that this season, uh, it is intolerable. And it's something that we're going to talk about with our staff and our players in the offseason. And we'll preach these things very heavily going into training camp. Um, we're mindful of our stakeholders and the respect and appreciation that each of them, each of you guys deserve. We have 
we feel very strongly that we have the right fans, that we have the uh, right principles, we have the right market to build a sustainably great team. And we, we set out to do that a year ago. That plan has not changed at all. And so that's why we're still here doing our thing. Thanks, Mike. Um, thank you all for coming this morning as well. Um, I'd say the professionalism that you guys have showed in coverage has helped me in year one. Um, I've learned to enjoy the season, learn how to work with you. But before we get into Wizards, I do want to say go Caps. Big win last night. Oh, she got it done. So that was huge. I'm looking forward to playoff hockey. I know my family is as well. We've had a good time going to Caps games. But when Michael and I kind of sit down and look at the season, um, in our roles, you're kind of asked to do things in the day-to-day, -day, like focus in on the day-to-day, -day, be in the fight with the staff, be in the fight with the players, while also keeping the long-term vision of the organization like in view. So it's kind of like me trying to get here this morning, 495, like the day-to-day -day is the traffic. Like the players, we're in the traffic every single day, but we also got to be the helicopter that's above it. That's like seeing where everything needs to go, playing Tetris on how you can get there. Um, so that's a delicate balance for us. At times, it could definitely be difficult. Um, but when you kind of take a step back, when you kind of search in between those moments throughout the season, I think you can look at the totality of the season and find that there was a lot of periods of progress for us. And for me, as we're like sitting here today to put a bow on 23-24, I think it all comes back to what drives us and what's most important. And that's the mindset of continuing to build towards our ultimate goal. And that ultimate goal hasn't changed. It's to create sustained team success for a long time and to do so in an environment that is both professional, but also repeatable day after day, no matter what happens the day before. And I think we took some serious strides towards that this season. Um, was it easy? Definitely not. I think Michael touched on some of that stuff. It definitely wasn't a linear season. There were mistakes, there were setbacks, miscues. Um, but at the end of the day, like those hard times created growing pains. And through the growing pains, you grow and you learn. And I think by the end of the season, we learned a lot about our staff and a lot about what goes into being a wizard and wizard player. So I know the record might not reflect success to some. Um, as we stated in September, those outcomes won't define us. Our success was going to be measured in our players' improvement, in our players' development, and the stacking of those incremental wins. And from the helicopter, you can kind of see those. When you're in the traffic every day, you can't. So it's kind of on us to make sure that we highlighted those to the players when we're going through it. The other thing we said that I thought was important at the beginning of the season was breaking the season up into segments every 10 games, 20 games, 30 games. We did trimester meetings with our players, 25 games, 50, 75. So people knew where they stood and they were like things to achieve within the long run of the season. And we can talk about what those things were, but I think we, we progressed and got there. I think Michael hit on some of them in the second half of the season. Um, so for me, I, I saw progress in that. We did get stuck in the mud. There were times during the season where my GPS was going off saying, recalculate, recalculate, turn around, figure it out. Um, but we did, and our players stayed with it, and we were better at the end of the season than the beginning, and that was a goal of ours. So we've talked last month or so, just kind of getting a feel for what the rest of the season was going to look like, spent time with our players individually, going to them dinner with them, just recapping the season. These exit interviews these last week with our staff and players have been really helpful. And like three main things kind of stood out to me. The first, um, and it kind of goes hand in hand with what I said before, but we maintained our cycle of discovery from the beginning of the season to the end. We will always look to be an innovative organization. Um, we will always look to try new things. But I think we were purposely more intentional this season. And I think we learned a lot. I think we learned a lot about the organization. We learned a lot about our players. And in talking to our players, they learned a lot about themselves that they didn't know they had. And for me, that's important. I believe the stat was 18 players on our team this year played at least 300 minutes, which would have been top five in the league this year. And it wasn't, it was a pretty healthy year for us until the end of the season. So these guys were getting opportunities during the season, um, during the beginning of the season, and then they did a great job of staying in the stay ready games, working on their body and playing with the go-go, the alignment there. When people were called up to the Wizards, they were ready to go and ready to play. So along with learning stuff about the players that were actually on the floor and discovering those things, we discovered stuff about individual skill improvement, about the pace of play we want to play with. I think we ended up second. And just stylistically, the things you want to throw out there, what type of big you want to play with. So 
not all of it worked. Not all of it was pretty. I, I completely understand that. Um, but I am happy that we had that mindset to try to uncover and discover. And we kept that from the beginning of the season on. The second thing that stood out to me, Michael touched on this as well, is we made some really positive deposits into the environment. Um, we're building the foundation of what that's going to look like. We're at the early infancy stages of that, but our players really chipped in. And I think they spoke about it on Monday. You guys probably know a little bit better than us. We paid attention to what they were hearing and what they were saying. But this is a place they enjoyed coming to work. There was a camaraderie that they hadn't had in some other places. There was a professionalism that they felt and that they helped create. And the consistency that I saw came from them doing the work. They, they were really rooted in doing the work, coming back, trying to improve, trying to get better. And a lot of players helped define what professionalism looked like with the Wizards, but pulled myself, pulled Mike, pulled the staff around them into defining what professionalism looks like for the staff as well. And that's just now. That's the bar now. That's the new standard. We will continue to work and improve and make another standard. But I think we took positive steps on that. And off the court as well, that stuff's super important to me, uh, making sure family services got improved upon, making sure that um, the guys had a more player-centric environment that they walked into every single day, more bonding on the road. And another driver of the organization will always be the community aspect. And I think our guys are serious about that and um, did a really good job on that. So we put a lot of deposits into the environment that we saw grow already. Some things will grow slower, but I thought that grew pretty fast. And the third theme, I would say, that kind of stuck out to us, where we're at now is kind of where we're going this summer. Um, a lot of people call it the off season. I'm kind of the guy that calls it a get better season. You're not really off. We're really working. I like to call it the jump season. I try to tell the guys, like, we're here to make jumps in the summertime, whether it's in your mental fitness, whether it's on the basketball stuff you want to improve on, whether it's in the performance, strength and conditioning space, or just like working on your body, being more flexible, getting in a stance lower. Those things are important, and you have to make jumps. I believe Sunday, when the ball stopped bouncing in Boston until training camp officially starts, there's 170 days. That's a massive amount of time to get better, a massive amount of time to take jumps. We don't expect players to show up October 1st, you're better. Let's no. Let's take a jump in May, take a jump in June, like flatten out a little bit in July, come back up in August, and then you get there. So it's just like we did throughout the season checkpoints getting to where we need to get to and having a program where everybody improves and make those jumps so that's why i call it the jump season not the off season because i can guarantee you we're going to work we're going to do that um but for the staff as well last year was a little rushed would you say uh, we got here and had to get right to it um we have a year under our belt we have our staff more continuity with the scouts with the front office we have a lot of stuff that we have to come up with this summer obviously it starts with a head coaching search and then goes into the draft and we'll be able to find out soon what level pick we have at the top of the draft, but we'll get a good pick there. We have another pick in the 20s, a pick in the second round, so we'll be able to add some young talent. We'll just be more developmental pieces to the puzzle. But we're excited for them, and we're excited for soon to go into free agency after that in summer league and see the jumps that we've made as an organization. So for me, I have a lot of optimism. Uh, I'm really optimistic about everything we have going on here in D.C. Uh, D.C., I'm happy about that. Um, Year one was a true learning experience for everyone. I would say myself especially. Uh, I can't wait to kind of debrief all of this and just really reflect on myself and how I could have been better and things I can do moving forward. But I, I know I learned a lot. But my optimism stems from, I would say my optimism looking ahead stems from how committed the staff and the players truly were this season. Um, I don't take that for granted. I, I want to thank them for that. But it also comes from knowing that the staff, the players, and truly the fans understand the vision. I can't tell you how many times I've been at the arena and someone's grabbed me, had a quick conversation, hey, we support you, keep doing what you're doing, or been at the airport where I find myself often at the airport, someone's grabbing me, talking to me, just talking about the team. And I love having those conversations at the season ticket member events. The, the fans get it. Um, they understand what we're trying to do. They really support us and they're so knowledgeable and I really appreciate that. And to the fans I haven't communicated with yet, I would just say what's being asked is difficult. It really is. Um, but just know that we intentionally chose this route, this route to escape mediocrity, as Mike said. Um, and we'll remain focused on that end goal, which is finding that sustained team success. And we won't skip steps in doing it. So I appreciate the way that I've been received by everyone in the city. 
my family's been received by everyone in the city. Year one was um, enjoyable for me. There's things we know we need to improve on, and we will, and we're excited for what that jump season will be allowed to do for the organization. Yeah, a uh, question for Will. You mentioned the pace. You guys are actually number one in pace. Um, I'm curious, is that um, just, was that a product of the personnel that you had, or is that something to expect moving forward, like a, sort of an overarching philosophy? Yeah, I think the way the game is going and how diverse the skill sets are, playing faster is, as you see, more scoring, allows for guys to touch the ball and move it get more time in the shot clock because defenses are getting better when you have a set defense. So for us, it was definitely personnel based. We had a lot of guys that can are young, can get up the floor and move. But we also had a lot of decision makers that can get the ball going. So the faster you play, the harder it is to predict what you're going to do. Um, it also, when the ball is going in, allows for more possession on the defense events. We got to get a little better on that part. But we were definitely intentional in trying to get up and down this year. Question for Mike. <clears throat> um, you guys had a lot of players have good years individually and put up good individual numbers. How do you kind of differentiate between that when you evaluate players' performances and, okay, this, this could apply to winning down the road, that sort of thing? I think it's a function of the continuity of those players playing together. And so we haven't had a lot of that. Um, obviously, we had a coaching change in season, which sort of, sort of reshuffles the deck. Um, we had a lot of new players this season. I don't. I don't know the number. I think it was maybe ten new players. I don't know if that. I don't know if that's right. It's like nine or ten new 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 players to the team this year. And so there, there's a pretty extraordinary lack of familiarity with each other, lack of continuity. And so to the extent that you we have that individual talent, whether it's the the jump season, or, or training camp together, um, I think more of that continuity on its own will help us perform better as a unit um, and sort of take a lot of those individual gains and, and, and feed them into um, game performance. Was that your question? Sort of, yeah. It was, it was kind of like <clears throat> if you're trying to sit through a lot of players who had good individual years and you're trying to say, like, okay, well, that could work on a winning team however many years from now. It seems like it would be a hard thing to decide. I think the game evolves, to be honest, and styles dictate kind of your personnel will dictate your styles I think what goals we give a lot of the players are to improve individually and they really really embrace those and end of season we're handing guys their booklets like here you did on the season a lot of people checked off their goals some even during the season checked them off and we had to create new ones so that got us to the point where the second half of the season like Mike talked about we were in those games we were competing in those games now turning that into more team dynamics, I think it starts with the bonding that he's talking about during the jump season, spending more time together, working on end of game situations. It was the first time Kyle was put in a lot of those situations to be the main closer in defensive doing things. Jordan's seeing it when he's making plays. So like that stuff's gonna get better the more you see it and we'll practice it a lot more too. But the individual gains allowed us to be in those situations. The next step is try to win more of those situations. Talked about evaluating the season in segments, especially in that final segment of the season, did you sense a, a, a culture and uh, identity start to emerge? I mean, I think about, this is for both of you, I think about games like the Lakers where they had to put their starters in, or, or even uh, Toronto where you're down by 29 in the first quarter, but you win the final three quarters. Uh, that's, a, that's a mental strength that, well, I just, your comment on, on how you evaluate that, because it, as you said, it's not about wins and losses. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, um, you, you sort of answered the the question within the question, it it does showcase that resilience. It shows the sh it shows the it showcases the resilience among the players. Um, it illustrates the continued competitiveness of the coaches to position the guys to potentially do something different in quarters two, three, and four than they were doing in quarter one. Um, you know, our, teaching a guy to, to 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 play or coaching a guy to play until the buzzer. Um, games are long. I, and I know it's you know it seems ridiculous. It's only forty eight minutes, but games are long, and not just air time. Um, if there are players on the floor that don't take a possession off, they're going really hard the minutes they're on the floor, and just being able to to eke out more and more of that as the season wore on, um, you almost don't even have to call attention to it because they know. I mean, they know uh, whether it's the Laker game. Um, there was a handful of games like that, um, but they know, 
And those are those incremental wins that we talked about early in the season. We used examples like um, we come out of we come out of halftime and force the opponent to call the first time out. It's like that's a win for us. Like these are these incremental wins or putting the starters back in, in you know late in the fourth. Like these are incremental wins. They're building blocks, and we can call upon those again and again and again. Um, you know, over the summer and in future seasons. Uh, we know that obviously Jordan's season started off in very disappointing fashion, and then he was able to turn it on these last six weeks or so post All Star break. What were the conversations like with him throughout the season, and what insight can you give us into how he was able to eventually get out of that slump and and finish the way he did? Yeah, um, Jordan is he's an incredibly introspective and kind person. I don't know if you've had a lot of time to spend with him, but um, the Jordan that sort of uh, generally gets written about and the Jordan that exists behind uh, a pair of spectacles are two, two different people. Um, he loves talking hoop. He loves it. Um, and he's a really smart, a really smart kid. And so like, he knew what he was going through early in the season. And he just kept telling us, like, I'm going to put in the work. I'm going to do the work. I'm going to do the work. The work will pay off. The work will pay off. And, you know, he, he was taking darts and bullets and everything else throughout the course of the season. He just ignored it. He ignored it better than I did, quite frankly. Um, um, he just kept saying, like, I'm going to work. I'm going to work, and the work will pay off. And um, to your point, I mean, I'll be damned, but, it, it, I mean, he had a slump, a long slump, and it was hard for him. It was hard for us to watch. Um, not as objective observers, but as people who can just, like, reach in and, like, fix a problem for him. Um, but he came through because he's a worker, he's a gamer, uh, he's a hooper, um, super high-character basketball player. Um, and it's just, you know, sometimes guys will surprise you by the amount of work they put in and how it pays off, and he did that. I, it was It was moving to watch him sort of come out of what he went through early in the season. Did you have anything you wanted to, to add? Um, I think Mike said most of it, just to take you behind the curtain with Jordan. My experiences with Jordan, they were always be where your feet are, and he was really good at that. He understood that this was a phase, it was going to pass, and what was going to get him through was his consistency and his work ethic. And like Mike said, he, he ignored the noise better than most I don't think what people understand is what got to him was the losing and not being competitive. It wasn't the stuff that people were saying about him because he always worried about the end result in terms of team. How can we be better, not just me? And he had a deep passion for that. He reached out to his teammates. We would have a lot of text exchange, a lot of talks on the plane after after games. And I just knew that he'd break through on that stuff. Did he have the season that he wanted from beginning to end? No. But. Did he finish the season on a way to give him more confidence to go into the summer and be the player we know he can be? Yeah. And again, that's how I kind of look at the season, not in just small little increments, but you break it down and then you see where you're at at the end. So one more quick follow up on that. The one change that did seem to be made structurally for him was putting the ball in his hands. Obviously, first the move to the bench and then ultimately when Tyus goes out, putting the ball in his hands as a starting point guard. Um, one, what, what conversations were that were just like Brian making the decision versus you all doing that collaboratively? And then two, Tyus is a, an unrestricted free agent. You guys when not trading him and also in the comments have said that we want him back. How do you square that of, of how that all could potentially work together moving forward? <laughs> and you're hitting upon what will be a very complex conversation for us. Um, Jordan does like having the ball in his hands, and he's really good with the ball in his hands. Tyus likes having the ball in his hands, and is also very good with the ball in his hands. Um, these are, I mean, it is our job, along with a head coach and a coaching staff, to figure out how to make that work. Both are really good basketball players and really good people. An organization like, like ours, or frankly, any organization but for where we are right now we can't have too many of those kind of guys um you know, Tyus to your point he is an unrestricted free agent and there are 29 other 29 other teams that know he's a good player and a good dude and he's going to have a lot of options he deserves to have those options he deserves to have those conversations um he did express to us an interest in coming back and we expressed to him an interest in coming back uh bringing him back we'll have those conversations in July um, but I, 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 
truly have no answers for you right now as to how how we make um, you know all of Jordan's best and all of Tyus's best coexist. Uh, once we have a coaching staff in place, that'll be one of the very first things that we roll up our sleeves and try to figure out. Hey, good morning, guys. Um, good morning. A couple of forward-looking questions for you. Uh, the draft is coming up in a couple months. We obviously don't know what pick you have yet, um, but where are you in the draft scouting process and what qualities are you looking for both on the court and off the court uh, with the player you're going to take with presumably a very high top three, top five pick? Well, first, can you work with the NBA so that I don't get yelled at for the lottery being on Mother's Day? Um, <laughs> that wasn't ideal when I saw that come out, but we will be in Chicago and, and see how that goes and see where our fate lies. Um, Nothing really changes on the draft. I think we've had this staff in place for longer than we did last time. So we definitely have more continuity. We have more feeling of what we're looking for in terms of characteristics. But any draft and any time you ask me, I promise this is not BS. We're going to draft people first, not players. And they have to have the core characteristics that will work in this building and will push us moving forward. So once we figure out who those people are and get to spend time getting intel and talking to them at the combine and really knowing what's underneath them and like what really makes them tick, then we'll kind of talk about more positional stuff and things that go on. But at first, we got to figure out who they are and if they can fit inside these walls. And a similar question just on the uh, head coaching search. Um, what is that search going to look like? Are you going to interview just everybody and anybody, or uh, how's that going to work? <laughs> yes. Literally, I mean, we're going to go to the phone book, <laughs> and we're just going to start interviewing people. Um, they probably don't even make phone books anymore. Is um, that yellow or white pages? That was yeah, white pages, that was, right? That was a white page. Got reference. it. Got it. Um, when, when we made the change in January, um, we talked as a, as a small group and we decided that we were going to give Brian and the team uh, as distract, as a, we wanted to give them a respectful, distraction-free environment to coach and play. And so the commitment we made was to give them um, no, uh, um, no reason to wonder what a coaching search might look like or you know uh, folks we might want to talk to or anything like that which is a different way of saying the creation for us of our coaching process actually starts today like we're meeting today as a group to talk about how we want to move forward with the creation of that process we don't have the process in place we don't have a list of names ready um and that was that was intentional. It was basically our way of giving our players and this coaching staff um, the freedom to be who they who they are, and without having to read about names or a process or visits that we're making or whatever the case may be. And so, uh, we've now concluded the season. Um, our core group will get together and we will we'll sketch out sort of how we want that process to look. Um, and we'll have you know more more details and more information on that even internally <laughs> uh, in the coming weeks. The only thing I would add to that is um, we'll look around and we'll definitely be inclusive. At the end of the day, I think we're going to find the right person um, who has the right core characteristics to lead this organization and lead this team. The things that we value most and will be able to lead us and move us forward in this current phase that we're in as a basketball club. Just sticking with BK for a second, um, he never talked about himself. He always talked about pouring into the group. I'm curious from management's perspective, what did he give the group that did you, you didn't have before when he was just a, an assistant coach? Um, probably just a, a bigger megaphone with which to express his belief in the guys. As as an assistant coach, it's hard to it's hard to pour into every single player because that's not the job. Um, but to your point, like he did pour into the guys and, and he gave them belief. He gave them belief as individual basketball players. He gave them belief as um, stewards of an organization. He gave them belief that they could achieve something that they hadn't individually achieved yet and that they could go out and perform. That's hard to do as an assistant coach. It's hard to touch every player as an assistant coach. And so um, moving into the head coaching seat, you have, you're no longer whispering in the ears of players. Like you're standing on, on stage with a megaphone 
and you're telling them all exactly how you feel in front of everybody else. And I think that that really helped uplift the group. Um, and I think it showcased who Brian is as, as a motivator, um, who isn't afraid of conflict, who, who's not going to run from holding guys accountable. And I think that just from that chair, he had, uh, he had the capacity to have a bigger audience. One last question. Both of you have kind of articulated the small wins through the season, but when you are in traffic on 495, mm. what is the one thing that you're extremely proud of that you two are able to accomplish this season? I'll start. Um, mine were the environmental gains that I, that I touched on at the beginning uh, in my open, just because you got to create a culture and environment where people want to be here, they want to come, and they want to get better. And I think that's what we saw this season, both from the staff, but from the players. And if we're creating and cultivating that, I think we're headed towards the right place to have our foundation to build up from. Um, specifically, we can go through a handful of players who had those career seasons, who bought into the player development system. So there's not just one player or one thing, but the idea that we enhance the environment from when we got here in June, that's probably the one thing that I'm most proud of. Um. There's a lot for me. Um, at the risk of discounting the others, the one that comes to mind for me the most is um, I'm 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 probably <clears throat> excuse me I'm probably guilty of being a little bit too much of a pleaser and maybe not turning off the noise, whether it's the positive noise or the negative noise. But in our exit interviews the last couple of days. Um, There were a couple guys that sort of um, made themselves vulnerable and shared with us how they felt about the organization, particularly the player development program and, and how we surround them with our staff. Um, they talked about, you know, I've never seen anything like that before or in all the places I've been, you know, I, nobody ever seemed to care that much about me or um, like guys coming into exit interviews, particularly when we finish the season with 15 wins, you, you, you sort of you, you have a flak jacket on. You're know, like waiting to just be peppered with all the things you did wrong. And that's not at all what happened. Um, they came in and, and they're saying thank you for things that were like, thank you. Like, what are you talking about? Like, you created this environment. Um, so just the togetherness that they exhibited throughout the season. Um, and then the candor with which they expressed a lot of their, their, their a lot of the things for which they were grateful for this season, and encouraged us to continue going forward, like that was sort of, I, I was I was proud of it. It, it, it. it sort of made, it sort of made the standings disappear for a day for me. Um, Will you touched on this a little bit? <clears throat> I wonder if you guys could go a little bit more into how different this off season is going to be for you guys, um, given that you now have kind of been through the phase where you're learning about and gathering information and understanding how things work. Um, how much more will you be able to kind of hit the ground running this summer? And then second to that, um, aside from the coaching search, what are some of your guys' off-season priorities? I know you have a to-do list, I'm, I'm sure, but what are some kind of tangible things that you're looking forward to hitting? You go, you go. It won't be an easier off season. It will be a I'm sort of embarrassed. That I just keep using the same words over and over and over. Um, we did a lot of heavy lifting last off season, and we moved like humongous um, features of the organization. And we don't necessarily have to do that this off season. So this off season is probably a lot of incremental moves, whereas last off season was a few significant moves. Um, and that's just transactionally I'm speaking about. We have, um, we have more time, you know, we have certainly more education, we have more wisdom about who our people are. And so, whereas for the better part of the last calendar year, we've been so roster focused, transactionally focused that despite some of the gains we made in the environment, we didn't really get to spend a lot of time on the environment. And so this off season we do. Um, 
I guess that's one of the rewards for having that time in April and May and June. Um, and so we'll do a lot of that. We'll do a lot of um, organizational work. We'll do a lot of, um, it's, it's uh, like environmental work. It, it, whether So we, we just redid some space in our practice facility, for example. We'll do more of that kind of stuff this off season. Um, and then this is our first off season to have our, our way of, as Will said, um, we didn't have a jump season last year. And so this year we actually get to have our young players commit to their individual jump season programming. And every now and then they come together and do it together. And so we didn't have, we didn't have any of that last summer. We we're going to have a lot of that this summer. Um, and then the to-do list, you mentioned it. Um, obviously, we have to hire a permanent head coach. Uh, we do have a high pick in the draft. Uh, we do have a couple of free agents that we are very interested in, at minimum, having a conversation with and at, at, at maximum bringing back. Um, um, you know, we're going to start uh, – we're, we're pretty eager to dig into the, the uh, schematics of redesigning Capital One Arena. And that's pretty fun. Um, and then it's just a bunch of little stuff, Ava. It's, you know, it, it, it's, it's adding more talent to the staff. Um, it is, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to spend a lot of time with the sticks. And, um, you know, Will and his team, they have a draft in two, uh, two and a half months. And, we currently have two first round picks and as we'll set a second round pick that could change that could that could become three first round picks or like who knows um but i mean the the eval team has has their work cut out for them for the next two and a half months too sorry mystics i'm gonna go see him in concert it's <laughs> <laughs> good okay. are they yeah. come sail away here we go <laughs> You good? We don't hear much about how your scouting department is growing or developing or performing. What are you both seeing with your scouting department, and uh, where do you want it to go in the um, next three, four months? I'm going to defer that to Will. <laughs> That's his baby. Um, very pleased with our scouting department. I think. People don't understand it's a 365 day job. The second the draft ends, you start working on the draft that's upcoming. And if I'm being honest and taking you behind the curtain a little bit, we have people who are already working on the draft two years from now. That's their sole focus. So you kind of just feed it into the next group who takes it from there. So <coughs> I, I enjoy being around that group. It's a, a bigger group for a reason because there's a lot of things to cover now. And, you have so much talent internationally. You have so much talent in the high school grassroots spaces, and the league's allowing us to go to more of those events. But the group is excited for this is our time to play. A lot of, you put the team together, and then you kind of watch it. You can help it a little bit throughout the season. But now it's the jump season where we hide, we go. Um, and those guys are on their way to Portsmouth today to start with the Portsmouth Invitational and go on to the combine, get draft visits going, and summer league and so on and so on. And obviously there's still some live games going on in Europe that we'll be attending as well. So it never really stops, but this is when it really have more time to focus in on that. And I, I feel highly confident that we'll be prepared for our summer. <clears throat> um, this being obviously an Olympic year, uh, how do you balance trying to figure out if Bilal is invited to play with the French national team and then the fact that it also leads right from summer league. How do you balance that of wanting him to play for his national team but also wanting him to potentially play at summer league and coming off of the injury? Yeah, um, very good question. I think a lot of our players have massive summers in front of them. None probably bigger than Bilal, just the steps he needs to make. And though I give the guy a lot of credit, um, coming in, transitioning into a new country, a new league with the maturity and the everyday approach that he did. And it really hit me when I'm texting him after the, the Bulls game. He goes up, lands, tries to dunk on someone and hurts his wrist, plays through it. Didn't even tell our staff that he was hurt until after the game. He was like, yeah, my wrist hurts a little bit. Um, 
texted him after the game, keep with it. Da-da-da. He's like, yeah, I'm, I can't wait for these last 15, 20 games to do a little bit more. And then that next morning I got to sit in front of him. We got to say, your wrist is broken. You're done for the season. There was probably two minutes of woe is me. And he was like, how am I going to benefit from this? And it was like, we get a jump start on your body. We get a jump start on your summer plan because you didn't have that last year. You played deep into the playoffs for France. You came straight here, straight into summer league, and your body hasn't really gotten a break. He's 19. So we instantly got really lucky that he can actually grasp the bar and do a lot more weight training and started his summer program. So we support all of our players if they want to play in the summer with their national <clears> teams <throat> and go to the Olympics. He's got to go in there and do what he needs to do to make the team. I hope he does. But at the end of the day, he's going to be here a good amount before that, really training and impacting and putting work in his game and putting work in his body. He's still here today, challenging me to left-handed horse competitions. Um, so he's still in the building, still working, and he's got the mindset that this is a massive summer for him. And whether he's playing with us, whether he's playing for France, we'll be involved, we'll be around, and we'll have a, a program in place to make sure he takes the jumps that both he thinks he needs to take and that we think he needs to take. Will, I'd like to ask you about two guys that was here before you guys got here that had quantum leaps in their games, mm. uh, Denny and Corey. Uh, can you speak to where they made the most improvement in their games throughout the year? Yeah. Um, I'll start with Denny. And when Michael and I first got here, that was one of the players we, we met with right away. Took him to dinner. I'm just like, hey, we need to learn you, learn about you, kind of what works, what you're about, what do you see, what do you want to be? And he was really open. You guys know Denny. He's probably too open sometimes to even you guys. But he's just a, a true, genuine person. And he was like, I think I can do more. And I think I can do more with the ball. Like, okay. Well, how are we going to work this summer to make sure when you get those opportunities, you'll be prepared? And they did a good job putting a plan in place for that. And Denny had a tremendous year um, from beginning to end mm -hmm. in terms of physically, he realized how strong he truly was. And he was getting downhill, uh, moving people. The basketball stuff spoke for itself on offense, having career highs shooting the ball, career highs in usage, um, career high in potential assists, which again, you're playing the right way, whether the shot goes in or not, you're making the right reads and right decisions, and also remained a plus defender. So he took a massive jump. And then we had similar conversations with Corey, and it was like, this is how people view you around the league, as this guy who you gotta run off the three-point line, and then you're good. But you don't hunt enough threes. We sat down like, these are the players that are around the same number of threes taken per 100 possessions as you. And he was like, mm, that ain't it. And these are where you want to get to. And he made a massive jump, um, extended his range, improved his arc, kept the efficiency high, and then was elite getting to the rim. Um, I think he had finished up 89th or 90th percentile finishing at the rim while also being able to shoot the ball and stretch the defense. And he was able to take pride in, I'm finishing games. Um, I'm not being targeted on either end of the floor like I'm contributing. And for those guys that have seen it before if we got here and really invest in what we were asking them to do and really kind of champion that player development program, couldn't be more happy with both of those guys. But they're both so young and still have jumps to make, and they know that. And I think they continue. that will continue. Um, will, when Kuz was walking out after his exit interview, he informed us that we have no idea how fun his summer is going to be. Um, I, I'm sure that is <laughs> He didn't share any of it with you? No, and I, I'm sure I do have absolutely no idea how fun <laughs> it's going to be for him. Um, but how much do you expect your guys to be in D.C. this summer, and, and how important is that kind of off-season program and for what you were talking about in turning the individual successes into on-court? Yeah, without a... Uh, revealing all of Kuz's summer plans. I have a good idea mind. where he's going to be most of the summer. Um, and it's going to be in the gym. It's just going to be in gyms around the, the world. Um, but he's going to start here. Um, a lot of our guys will be home base here. A lot of the players in their first to third year, we'll see them in a few weeks to a month. Um, they want to get back. They want to train. And they want to go through a program where it's not team training. They're coming back and they're doing their individual training here. They'll have their own strength coach and they'll be working with their own athletic care person and spend time with their own individual basketball coach and work on their plans. So I think a lot of our guys plan on being in D.C. this summer. Um, we talked about potentially going to visit. Hey, if someone's got someone going on in their hometown, let's all go to their hometown and hang out. Let's all come to Summer League this year and hang out and be around each other. So I think you'll see more bonding outside of D.C., but you will see a lot more bodies in the gym in D.C. from May all the way through August. Then? I'm sorry, what? Then? In D.C., I said. You'll see the bodies in D.C., right. not in MHPC. <laughs> a little different, yeah. Um, uh, Michael, I wanted to ask you also, um, 
you've been in, in building situations and before it on previous stops. I, I wonder if there's kind of a singular thing that you didn't realize um, before you started the job that makes DC different from all of those other places. I assume there's a lot of similarities in saying, okay, here's what I want to put in place, and you know more things than you did in OKC and in LA and everything, but how did this, how is this one stacking up, I guess? That's a big <laughs> question, sorry. Um, there's the gut answer, and then there's the, let Just me be that. super, super, super diplomatic answer. Um, I'll give you the gut answer. Um, the other places that I've been where we sort of undertook uh, various degrees of a rebuild, where in some cases on the heels of, like with the Clippers, for example, um, like they had a lot of success before we sort of reset the cycle. Um, they were just coming off Lob City, you know, Chris, Blake, TJ, JJ and the gang. Um, they were fun, you know, great theater, uh, deep playoff runs, and they were always, you know, like an injury away from potentially getting to the next place. Um, in Oklahoma City, when Will and I were together there early, they were a brand new franchise. And so there was just so much excitement around the city just to have a team. And then you have this just incredible core of young talent in Kevin, Russ, Serge, James, Jeff. Um, like you could just you could just see how 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 much um, talent was in the gym, and you knew at some point this was going to take a monstrous leap. It's been much harder here than I anticipated, and I think it's because it doesn't feel yet like the reset of a cycle. It feels like it fe like we're not coming. We're not a new franchise. Um, we didn't just come off of, you know, seven, eight years of conference finals appearances. Um, and I, I, I sense, I, I poorly predicted, and I sense now um, just the fan difficulty. I mean, they've been extremely supportive. They show up to every game. Uh, they're there. When our guys play hard, I mean, our guys had standing ovations this year, sometimes in losses. Um, that was awesome. Um, but they've been starving for longer than the other places I've been. And I, I, I am now appreciating how that can feel. <clears throat> and of course we have to take that. I'm like, we have to own that. I mean, it, it's not like we can just ignore it, but that would be one way I would characterize sort of the difference in my experiences. Michael, I know you've known Will for some time, but what have you learned about him during this year that perhaps you didn't know before, or what did you have reinforced in your perception about Will over this past year? Uh, I had always known and reaffirmed this year that I'm considerably more handsome than Will. <laughs> Debatable. <laughs> um, when we talk about it internally a lot as a group, but his range is absolutely incredible. And I don't mean, all well, his court range is pretty good too. Um, I mean, his ability to ace any exam in any subject at any time. I, I didn't, I mean, I knew I wanted him to be my partner in this. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that in the seven years that, or the six years that um, we didn't work together, that he, I mean, every subject matter, every subject matter, every exam, anytime, he'll ace it. And I, I, I didn't know that. Uh, thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. I don't tell him what to say. Uh, Will, what have you learned a little bit about Michael in uh, this year with him in a role that he's never had before? <laughs> I have to say it on the mic. Um, a lot. I think it's more reaffirming than anything. Um, he's all about his actions and the content of the character and what he truly believes in and what matters. I haven't been around someone who's been more supportive and given me more grace, but also been empathetic 
along the way. And he truly cares deeply about what we have going on here, um, about the people who work here, and about what people think. Um, and his commitment level, I knew he wanted this job and I knew he was going to be committed and we were going to be a good pairing. But the commitment level he has to making sure we get this right is inspiring to me every single day and gives me more passion and more belief when I come into work. So um, it doesn't come through. You guys don't see him every day, but he wears it. He, he wears a lot of this stuff and he takes it seriously. And we're going to be nonstop in partnership trying to make sure we get this to the, where we wanted to get it to. And I couldn't ask for someone better to have that belief in me, but also continue to mentor me through this whole process. Last question, Dave. <laughs> the closer. The clo well, it should be a better question. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but just it occurred to me, a number of the players that, you know, uh, Jared Butler, Justin Champagne, getting opportunities. H how important was the Capital City go-go to the uh, establishment of the, the foundation you wanted, not only this season, but going forward? And just how important is it to have them in the, in the same building? Will can articulate it way better than me. The word that comes to mind is enormous enormously huge like enormously huge that's how valuable they were having them in the same building in the same market being able to toggle back and forth the coaching staffs had really amazing synergy uh, but I, I will says it way better than i can and do um but what an amazing opportunity to have them coexist yeah um the alignment kind of jumps out to me when we first got here we spoke with people that had an experience with both last year and a lot of times the left hand didn't know what the right hand were doing and we wanted to day one to fix that I give Amber Nichols a lot of credit for seeing that on the day to day she does a tremendous job of making sure our GM of our go go that things are aligned we went through a pretty extensive coaching search you can ask coach Thompson um, to try to really find the right person who would fit in would bring new ideas but also allow um, the systems that our head coach with the Wizards wanted and Cody is able to bring that every single day. He brings a lot of juice, a lot of joy to the guys, and he's sharp. And when we talk about innovation, he's coming up with some some cool things. Even the last game of the season, the point four play, where we throw it off the backboard from out of bounds and tips it in, everyone else is looking, and our players know what they're doing. So there was a lot of cohesion on that. And I think the player development plan, like there were goals when you were with the Wizards, there were goals when you were with the Go-Go, and you were expected to play the same way. It wasn't like you're in the G League, go get 30. It was to work on what you need to work on that will allow you to help with the Wizards. And I think Mike gave you the stats on how competitive we were at the end of the season. Um, we were third in the NBA, and 60% of our games were in those clutch moments. And a lot of that stuff was with Jared Butler on the floor, with Eugene, with Justin, with Jules, with Johnny, with Patrick, who took huge steps. Um, so for them to be able to be in competitive games in the NBA after finishing competitive games with Gogo, I think that's a testament to that. And the last half of the season, our shot quality in terms of where we took shots from on the floor was top five in the NBA the second half of the season. Our potential assist the second half of the season was top 10. So we're playing the right way, taking the right shots. We need to take jumps in our efficiency and making those shots. And a lot of those guys were playing that way. So for me, I felt really good about that. And I think that cohesion starts with the go-go and then stylistically ladders up to how we played with the Wizards. So. Brian did a really good job of reaching out to Cody as an assistant, and then once he got the head job, um, they were in communication daily, and the players never felt like they were disconnected. And like Mike said, being in the building, it's it's just massive. It's huge. Because once upon a time, when there wasn't this G League, those stories of those players that developed yeah. wouldn't have happened. Is that fair to say? I mean, they, they would get sure. lost. It was a lot harder. Um, credit to the NBA for allowing us to expand the roster. Uh, adding two-way players, adding a third two-way player this season. There's so many guys that, like, can you break through that are probably 400 guys that could be on a rotation or can be at the end of the roster. But, like, what breaks you through to becoming a rotation player? And I think we saw some of our guys take jumps. And as we continue to evaluate who's going to be here, who won't be, and take a fresh look at the roster every year, guys that can fight through and show that they have promise are better off than they would be if they were playing in Europe or not connected as tightly with the team. Um, with their own minor league system. And soon, every team's going to have their own minor league club, including Mexico City, so there'll be more chances to watch everybody. So I think the, the league in, a, in general has done a really good job with that.